Now, more and more research and studies are, are made in this and the effects of artificial intelligence within the field of mental health, as we just said, and it's growing very fast. Here to tell us more about the potential of artificial intelligence uh, to provide support for low intensity CBT and providing a scalable solution to the continuing treatment gap is Paul Ferrand, professor at the University of Exeter in the UK. Uh, welcome, Paul. Are you with us? I am indeed, or I think I am. Excellent. Sorry, I saw someone else. <laughs> uh, uh, go ahead. Welcome. Okay. Well, thank you for inviting me to this session. It promises a lot, and obviously this is a very cutting-edge group of research that we're talking about, and also, hopefully, solutions to some of the challenges that we're facing with mental health. So if you could move on to the next slide, please. So what I'm going to hopefully do is try actually in some ways pick up on the previous speaker's talk. And basically, we need to think about doing things differently. We, mood disorders represents a public health challenge. Um, across the world, the majority of common mental health problems go unrecognized and they go untreated. And basically, the previous way of doing things actually isn't working. Um, as part of that, the treatment choice for many services remains antidepressant medication. And there's nothing wrong with antidepressant medication. It's evidence-based. But as long as people choose that that's what they want. Um, if they don't choose, then we have to have alternatives. And the alternatives that are... We, we know are already existent, are evidence-based psychological approaches. We do have evidence-based psychological approaches, and this is dealt, and this is driven by the evidence base. Um, but often, and the previous way of delivering, uh, often resulted in very high costs of delivery. We had a, an expensive workforce. We had protocols that would suggest for depression, for example, 16 to 20 hours of, um, of uh, treatment, CBT, for depression through the National Institute of Health and Care Excellence uh, freight, uh, guidance in the UK. So we had the high cost of delivery on one side and the other side of the high cost of delivery, the demand is we soon had waiting times for psychological therapy. And before the improving access to psychological therapies in some parts of the United Kingdom, they were 12, 13, 14 months. And that's unacceptable. You're not offering a service there. So we needed to think about different ways of doing things. If you could move on to the next slide, please. So what we really needed was a revolution not an evolution, we've tried to evolve mental health service delivery for a long period of time. And basically we got, we, we, we didn't progress. So we needed a revolution, but that revolution isn't just talking about technology um, to support the delivery. It's actually talking about something far more fundamental in which technology can actually exist and be one of the solutions to demand and to choice. And that is the organization of care. And something that we realize within the improving access to psychological therapies program is the organization of care had to take in a few, um, into account a few things. It had to take, take into account evidence-based psychological therapies and what's evidence-based for whom and what's evidence-based for the series of common mental health problems that present. And we did this by adopting something called stepped care. And we're talking about this being implemented, as this previous speaker said, within the Improving Access to Psychological Therapies program, the model of which is now being considered in other countries. So I'm doing some work in the United States with certain states and in Canada most recently that are looking at some of the benefits of trying to improve access through a variety of mechanisms. So I'm gonna go on and talk about stepped care. If we could move on, please. So stepped care really is a way of organizing mental health service delivery. 
and the National Institute of Health and Care, and Care Excellence. For those of you who don't know what this is, it's a group, a panel of experts who look at the evidence, grade the evidence, because as we know, there's a lot of so-called evidence out there, but actually once you start sifting it for quality evidence, then actually it drops away massively. So it's some of the challenges and some of the need to be able to grade and, and identify good from not so good quality evidence. But on the basis of evidence, NICE recommends the step care service delivery model. It's not the only one. There are matched care um, service delivery models. And there's some research done by people like Annamika Van Stratton that's compared the two. But whilst there were no difference in outcomes, step care was noted, was recognized to be the cheaper way of delivering um, psychological therapies. According to stepped care, the treatment that people receive is based upon the severity. And this picks up on something that the previous speaker said. So we start to identify the severity of the presenting common mental health problems. So we, we classify those in terms of, uh, you know, by the PHQ-9 and the GAD-7 for depression and anxiety, respectively, in terms of mild, moderate, and severe severity, because different evidence-based interventions reside at different levels of the step care model, and they're targeting both different disorders which are presenting and also different severities of the disorders. And then progression, you must be able to progress through the step care model because it's dependent on changes in severity and all the impact that the mental health difficulty has for the person. So one of the characteristics of step care is you must be able to progress up or down the step care model according to clinical need. And another characteristic of the step care model is we have a varied workforce. We don't have a one size fits all workforce. So we've identified separate workforce, the competencies associated with different workforces to deliver psychological therapies at different steps of the step care model. So if we could move on the next slide, please. So this is the service redesign that we use in the improving access to psychological therapies. So we have different intensities of psychological therapies at the different levels. So minimal symptoms, step one, is basically dealt with in the community. And these are people who have sub-threshold levels of severity for the common mental health difficulties. Step two is the low intensity cognitive behavior therapy. And that's for mild to moderate presentations of depression and the majority of the anxiety disorders with the exception of social phobia and also post-traumatic stress disorder. There is no evidence-based step two intervention currently. So these would be escalated to where the evidence is at step three. And at step three, we have high intensity psychological therapies, and that's for the moderate to severe depression and anxiety. And then at step four, that's where the treatment for severe and enduring mental health difficulties becomes, comes in. Now, what we have is different workforces at different levels. So we have a workforce, a psychological well-being practitioner workforce at step two. We have our high intensity classic therapy workforce at step three, or our clinical psychology workforce, which are increasingly de delivering psychological therapies in, in the UK. And then at step four and five, you start moving into psychiatry or specialist mental health nursing. Now, one of the so one of the characteristics of this and one uh, is that step two low intensity CBT is supported. The evidence base suggests it needs to be supported. It comes in the form of self help interventions based on a CBT model. The self help the the amount of support is reduced compared to high intensity psychological therapy, which tends to be fifty to sixty minutes. So in terms of guided CBT self-help, we're talking about 25 to 35 minutes to support the interventions and the therapy is delivered by the intervention and the psychological practitioner supports the patient using that intervention. So we have that specialist psychological practitioner workforce. 
but there's a slight challenge if we want to make a difference on a worldwide scale. And that's to do with if we have a workforce, we have limits to scalability. Whilst it's a cheaper workforce, not, not any, and it's not inferior, but it's a cheaper workforce with far more limited competencies. But that limits the ability to be highly and truly scalable. And this is where AI and technology delivered approaches can actually come in really helpful within a stepped care model. Can we move on to the next slide, please? So this is what I was talking really about, the evidence base currently suggesting we need support for CBT self-help. So this is some research I did with Joe Woodford, a systematic review. And once again, we graded the quality of evidence, and then we looked at what was left in terms of good to very good quality evidence. And there was an advantage for support over self-administered. Self and there's three types of support. There's guided, which is about 25 to 30 minutes. And this involves the psychological practitioner actually supporting the patient who is experiencing difficulties with some of the specific factors. And they will also encourage the patient to move through the self-help interventions. We have minimal contact. This is five to 10 minutes. And this is where the psychological well-being practitioner will actually check in to make sure that the patient is, is progressing through the interventions and they will offer encouragement and they will ensure that the patient knows what they're doing in the next session between sessions and move them through. And then we have self-administered where the patient just uses the interventions on their own. This we have, if we look at the effect size, then we're looking at a moderate effect size for guided and for minimal contact, not interestingly, not much difference. So IAPT has adopted the guided model, whereas the minimal contact seems just as effective. About self-administer, we, um, we're talking about a minimal effect size. The effect size drops, therefore it justifies the use of support. If we could move on, please. Now, what we've also noticed, however, is we've done a systematic review looking at low intensity cognitive behavior therapy for medically unexplained symptoms. And something interesting see, uh, occurred. First of all, we had the guided, the minimal contact and the self-administered. And we had very much the same pattern of results as we did for uh, depression and anxiety in that there was a benefit of having support over self-administered. But we also noticed that there was another, another type of support, and we call that automated. And I think in retrospect, that's not the best name for the type of support. But, but this is basically support that's being provided by technology. So and a good example of this was Sleepio. And as we see, we had a very, very large effect size with Sleepio, very much larger than you would normally see. And that may be to do with the sample size in the research, because it's quite because it was a low research um, sample size. It wouldn't really allow definitive um, conclusions. However, the research was of good enough quality otherwise to actually make it into the systematic review. And what they adopted was what they called a virtual therapist. So they had um, an algorithm that was picking up and driving the amount of support and the usage of the intervention. And that was based on outcomes at baseline, the amount of adherence that the person had to the, um, to the, uh, the, the techno technological uh, CBT program, and also performance and progress. So the algorithm would obtain this information as the person was using it and feeding the information in. And then it would offer support and advice regarding moving forward or the best evidence-based CBT technique for that pro the level of progress. And the CBT techniques, the single strand techniques was sleep restriction, stimulus control. They had some cognitive techniques, progressive muscle relaxation and mindfulness. So the app, the, um, the, the interface, the, the algorithm-driven system was actually getting feedback 
using the algorithm to help the person move through the use of the technology. If we could move to the next slide, please. So we have actually now, there's been a lot of progress in this area. And there, as, as was mentioned, there are thousands of apps. There are thousands of systems. One system that I'm aware of, simply because the guys that run this new startup company came to me, and this is Iona Mind, to really try to understand from a research perspective what, how we could really enhance and put the effort in to enhance the usability and the effectiveness of the app in which they've, um, which they've developed. So they've developed it for cognitive restructuring, and now I understand they're moving to generalized anxiety disorder, and they're basing it on low intensity CBT interventions. So they're not making them the high intensity complex approaches, they're using the evidence about low intensity, and they're trying to use the single strand CBT technique approach. And the idea here is to replicate the benefits of what we call automated support through an AI chatbot. And what the AI chatbot is able to do is it's able to use common factors to help the patient um, to engage with the intervention. And we know common factors enable uh, effect size to be reached. It's not the only solution and you can't just reside, use common factors alone, but they're part of the solution. It in probably enhances engagement so people get the right amount of dose of treatment. And we know this is currently a limitation because the amount of people that get the right dose of treatment through these technologies is quite minimal. It doesn't engage people. Then what the um, chatbot is able to do is able to actually offer support around the specific factors of the low intensity CBT intervention. So it's gaining momentary assessment information back from the person's use. And then it's able to target the specific factors that the person is encountering. As is, and then it's able to offer advice and support the person just the same as a psychological well-being practitioner would do in terms of face-to-face -face human support. If we could move on to the next slide, please. So we have a lot of research actually that is beginning to, um, to emerge that's suggesting electronically de delivered CBT. And I've got the reference there because there's a very good paper that says we need to start using standard terminology, because sometimes we're talking about the same thing, computerized CBT, electronic CBT, mobile CBT, and sometimes it's getting confused with other approaches. But what this, um, what the research by Loire says is that technology-driven approaches, electronically delivered approaches, are at least as effective as face-to-face -face CBT. The evidence of was, was of moderate quality and there was heterogeneity in the data, but it's beginning to suggest we can provide that supported function, which the evidence base suggests you need, but actually we can do it in a way through the use of technologies, such as an app or a CCB, a computerized CBT system, where this technology is built in. In the IAP program, we know digitally enhanced technologies are massively underutilized. There's a lot more out there that are currently being used. And there's over-reliance potentially on the human face-to-face -face support or telephone support provided by the psychological wellbeing practitioner. Now, if we look at um, eCBT solutions, we can potentially enhance the functionality of the intervention by supporting the specific factors. We can potentially reduce delivery costs by actually providing that support within algorithmically driven support functions. This will allow us to promote scalability. And also, increasingly, these approaches are being seen as acceptable. So it's no longer the case that if we design these well enough, that they're not acceptable. However, also picking up on one of the questions, there are concerns. We need to ensure the quality 
we need to ensure the security and indeed the efficacy of if we're talking about mobile phone apps. We shouldn't be recommending or we shouldn't be using mobile phone apps if we don't put a tick against each of these areas. And the National Institute of Health and Care and Care Excellence are looking at making recommendations around specific apps as much as they're able to. Although it is a big undertaking and at the moment they're not in that position, but they do make give guidance on quality and security of mobile phone apps. If we could move to the next slide. So we need to think about considerations and it was really nice to see a question come up in the previous talk that if we're thinking about making electronic CBT an asset, it should be well informed, it should be scientifically credible, it should be peer reviewed in publications and it should be evidence based. So these, I think, are the minimal criteria. So before we keep pushing the development of more and more apps, we need to start taking a step back and thinking about some of these characteristics before we start recommending the use of any system. If you could move to the next slide, please. So that's basically a bit about where I come from as well. And my email is at the bottom. And if anyone would like to get in touch about anything in my talk or understanding low intensity CBT, because I appreciate this may be new to some of you outside the United Kingdom, then by all means, get in touch. And that's my presentation. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we do have two questions. One question from the audience uh, and actually from the Church of Sweden. What are the activities at step one in the community you've talked about and what's the target group you're training here? Okay, so in step one, it's very much the use of upskilling members of the community, whether it be charitable groups or particular individuals that are trying to support people but it's predominantly focused on prevention. It's not focused on treatment. What we're trying to do with subthreshold is offer evidence-based supports, and it may be basic psychoeducational groups. There's an increasing use of some CBT-driven techniques in a way that will actually work for prevention, but they're not being seen as treatment. But it's engaging the community it's engaging people, community sector organizations, and it's also engaging particular organizations or community groups that work with people with diversity, because we know to, we need to engage people um, with, uh, with diversity, with often members of their own community. So really that's about empowering the community to offer the preventive approaches. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you for that um, answer. And uh, I know that you've worked with Joanne that's here with me in the studio. And uh, I think, Joanne, that you have a question also. Yeah, I have a quick question for you, Paul. So we've spoken a lot about how many, for example, apps are out there. So there's a huge quantity of e-mental health interventions that are available for anyone to download, but really varying quality, varying evidence base or none no evidence base at all. And um, one of the things you mentioned about the idea of having this automated support or having uh, a chat bot, um, and you mentioned about quality, you mentioned about the evidence base and security, but I just wondered, what are your thoughts about safety, patient safety? That's something we've uh, not touched on so much today. Yeah, um, and obviously it has to be a considerable concern. So it's a matter of understanding what makes safety. So, for example, Joe, I guess you might be talking about risk assessment. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so we need we, we know that, and indeed from our practical practitioner workforce, we can do very, very good risk assessments. But one of the challenges with using AI is actually acting on the risk assessment once it's done and once it's flagging that there may be an issue. And actually in terms of implementation, I think this is potentially a wider consideration. And this is why it's so good to think not only about the apps or the technologies, but how they fit within a wider system. So it may be that as well as having AI or apps, 
then there needs to be some some flagging or notification process that if someone is scoring high on risk, the very least is that they're informed about measures that they can take to manage their risk, potentially maybe notifying uh, someone who's overseeing um, the, the use of the app, et cetera, about that risk and getting them to manage and follow some protocol. But indeed, it's not an easy one, and it's something that hasn't been given enough consideration, I don't think, by anyone as far as I'm aware. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that.